at some point we are going to have to do a whole show about how good this show sounds. Welcome to Down Ballot. We do the show live every Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Welcome, podcast listeners. And just real quick, all you podcast listeners out there, if you didn't check out last week's show, make sure you grab the video of that on our YouTube. Um, we gave you a little bit more of a taste of what a regular like late night live show is here, where we had the chat up and we were talking to chat. And uh, we went over a long form piece of content and we're throwing bombs mostly at Matt Mahan. Uh, who we decided is evil, evil Beto, and uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and um, hopefully we'll find other long form content going forward. Maybe once a month we can do down ballot a little more in that style. Anyway, I am producer Dave. You can find me in many places, uh, but today you can find me going viral, making fun of Elon Musk for begging Stephen King for eight bucks, and also on Grinder. <laughs> 
And you can find uh, me, that's the councilman on Twitter at T H E underscore councilman. I uh, would love to see you there. Please join my massive following of 31 people. Um, and uh, I'm also frequently uh, flying in public comment at uh, you know city council and other public meetings. In fact, that's probably where we can get some of our more long form content. I find that a uh, especially council meetings, um, not just in San Jose, but around uh, Santa Clara County and Silicon Valley tend to be pretty uh, uh, fun, shall we say, and insightful um, and intriguing and have a lot of interesting folks show up to, to comment. Um, we could even dig into like a school board um, because I think they stream all their, their stuff now too. So uh, we'll pick something short. I like that idea. It's a good way to break up the, the content. But um, tonight... Uh, we're going to go through a typical docket, but we're going to we are going to have a focus on local elections because it is one week from today uh, is the general election nationwide, especially and of course right here in California and right here in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. We have a lot of um, obviously big national elections to be uh, concerned about: Senate, control of the House, um, but. We're also looking more locally here at very substantial changes to the San Jose City Council. Um, the mayor is going to be changing out. Three of the council members will be changing out. So you're going to have a significant, uh, in, or three could be changing out. So you're going to have a significant influx of new blood next year, and it could lead to new directions um, for the biggest city in the county. And as San Jose goes, so does go the county generally. Um, and then you've got the county supervisor race. You've got several ballot measures on, out there uh, contending with each other. So, um, there's a lot happening, and we're going to try and cover as much of it as we can. And there's a sheriff's race. Did you know that, Bruce Dave? We're electing I, I a new did. sheriff. I yeah, did. and it's not going to. It's not going to be the old boss. Meet the new boss. Six-term Santa Clara County Sheriff Lori Smith submitted her resignation to the county today, abruptly stepping down from the department where she's worked nearly 50 years. The move comes as jurors in a civil corruption trial delay. I wouldn't call her stepping down abrupt. Yeah, no, it definitely pre precipitated by a long string of scandals. I would say um, I'm surprised it took this long, which is the opposite yes. of abrupt. Yes, so is Sam Licardo. Whether she abused her powers in office. Rich Robinson, Smith's political consultant, explains why she chose today to retire. She wanted to re retire on her own terms. And the trial was important for her to go through so she could prove her innocence. And she didn't want to have any pressure to leave office because of false charges on corruption. Robinson also says the timing of Smith's retirement was not an attempt to save her pension. She gets her pension either way. She's been in a sheriff's office for over 49 years. She's earned that pension. She gets that pension regardless of the outcome of this trial. Three other attorneys I talked to back him up, saying a civil conviction would not endanger Smith's pension. San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo reacted to Smith's retirement, issuing a statement saying, more than a year ago, I publicly called on Sheriff Lori Smith to resign, and she has belatedly heeded that call. Oh, you can tell he's on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> Burning them bridges. Remains well, she's on the way out, too, so he doesn't have to worry about, you know, offending her at this point. A troubled department and to better address many long neglected issues, particularly regarding jail oversight. Under Sheriff Ken Binder is now stepping in to lead the department in the interim. In the meantime, the jury in Smith's civil case is deliberating whether she's guilty of six counts of willful misconduct and corruption, including accusations of favoritism in her issuing of concealed weapons permits and evading the reporting of gifts. In San Jose, Marianne Favreau, NBC Bay Area News. Yeah, the idea that this was abrupt was kind of silly. Yeah, our long national nightmare or local nightmare is over. <laughs> um, so ABC News apparently got an exclusive, I, I don't know if we'd call it an interview with uh, Sheriff Smith, but they did ask her a few questions so we can find a little more from her perspective. Um, but I do find find it interesting to hear all the the rumor mill churn about her pension and everything else and it's true she won't she will probably get her pension regardless of this the outcome of this trial um but to hear like i want to go out of my own terms and uh, prove her innocence like i don't one, i don't think this trial is going to prove her innocence and two i it, by going it you know i guess she's going out in her own terms and that she didn't wait for the end of the trial or the end of her her term in office right she was elected to the, the term in office so she could have just served out the last two months of her publicly elected uh term and then left on her own terms if you will so, uh, but here's a little more your decision to uh well i'm hoping resign. For, i'm no i'm hoping for a verdict today 
Former Santa Clara County Sheriff Lori Smith talks only with ABC 7 News about her decision to resign, insisting that her ongoing corruption trial had no effect on her decision to hand in her sheriff's badge today. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dan Ashley. And I'm Dion Lim. The former sheriff's attorney is asking to have the case against her dismissed, even as the jury considers a verdict. ABC 7 News IT reporter Dan Noyes has an exclusive report now from Superior Court in San Jose. Santa Clara County Sheriff Lori Smith informed the Board of Supervisors in this one-line letter that she was leaving office effective today. Just two hours later, I questioned her about the decision as she entered Superior Court for her corruption trial. Why not serve the rest of your term? Because there will be a new sheriff coming in. and Actually, in November, there will be the new selection. And the trial didn't affect, affect your decision to uh, well, I'm hoping resign? For a, I'm, no, I'm hoping for a verdict today. This civil trial could remove her from office, but Smith could face criminal charges involving the same issues. Accusations that she provided concealed carry weapons permits in exchange for political donations or other favors. District Attorney Jeff Rosen released a statement that reads in part, The two million people of this county need and deserve a great sheriff. Our focus is, has been, and will be on the fair and effective management of the criminal justice system. No one is above it, and no one will stand in its way. San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo weighed in. More than a year ago, I publicly called for Sheriff Lori Smith to resign, and she has belatedly heeded that call. It remains for the county to rebuild a troubled department. And the leading candidate for her job, Kevin Jensen, told me it's the right decision made two or three terms too late. Abused power and trust may give temporary gain, but eventually lead to pain and a bitter end. The jury wrapped up today without reaching a verdict. The court is dark tomorrow, back at it Wednesday, with the two sides arguing whether the charges should be dismissed now that Lori Smith is no longer sheriff. For the I-Team in San Jose, Dan Noyes, ABC 7 News. Wait a minute. Are they, are they trying to say that because she resigned, actually, don't worry about it, and actually now that none of this even happened? Well, see, now that sounds like a much more reasonable reason why she would uh, decide to resign now, right? Um, so that her lawyers can go in there and say, well, she's no longer sheriff, so it doesn't really matter. Um, it's not really how the courts work. <laughs> it's not really how that works. So uh, she's going to have to face the, the music one way or the other here. Um, it's too far down the road already. Um, so uh, the most, the, whatever motion her attorneys file is going to fail. That's ridiculous. Like she broke the law. It's not as though... Um, yeah, no, I, I, if we could prosecute Donald Trump for all of his crimes in office today, it wouldn't make any damn difference if he was president or not, right? So not that Donald Trump is Lori Smith and vice versa, but yeah, get my snow drift. So, uh, so long, Sheriff Smith. Well, it's just, it's just stunning to me that like the idea that you would be like, actually, I quit my job. So none of the charges against me should still stand. Like we don't, right. like we don't do that for like anybody, the assistant manager at McDonald's, the president, like we, we you know what I'm saying? It, you don't yeah, do yeah. that for if, anybody. If, if I embezzled millions of dollars from my boss, right? Or from my company, right? And uh, they fired me, <laughs> I couldn't go to court and say for, for embezzling and then they took me to court, right? I couldn't go to the, the judge and say, well, I no longer work there, so it's fine. <laughs> I can keep the money, right? Uh, so... Yeah, it's it, it's a ridiculous argument, um, but unfortunately, Sheriff Smith has really um, just proven throughout the course of uh, all of these controversies uh, why she's not fit for office. She just hasn't really handled it very well, frankly. Um, and her political consultant, notwithstanding, he's a good guy, but I don't, you know, I don't think they've really handled the messaging or any of it really well. And she's certainly. She, she should certainly not be talking to anyone off the cuff. Period. Because um, I just don't think she has. Um, her head and her shoulders if you want to be really frank <laughs> right now yeah i mean the political i uh, you know we'll give we have to give the political consultant a pass because it's just that person's yeah. job to yeah. like stop the stop correct. the breach or whatever you know to uh correct. mitigate the damage as much as possible so that they can go on and do more political consulting later i just don't exactly yeah i mean maybe the problem that she's had handling the messaging has something to do with what the fact that what she did seems to have been wrong and so it's like really hard to message yeah. around that it's really hard to message around the truth right and the facts and the fact that you fucked up right um at least here um some depending on how broad and well healed the, the the bubble is around you right um usually typically like someone at the top like this can insulate themselves well enough that they don't get 
like they can they can withstand it right an underling or a deputy takes the fall um so here it's just unfortunately uh, becomes so obvious that she was directly involved um that anything she says at this point sounds pretty disingenuous because the proof is just abundantly clear so um we're gonna find out what happens in the trial pretty soon so we'll bring that to you here on down ballot but for now the sheriff is no more we have a new sheriff in town for the next two months basically until <laughs> until the new sheriff is elected next week uh kevin jensen who you heard from in a statement there and bob johnson who was the former chief of palo alto police so yay a former deputy and a former police chief and great i'm excited um both white guys by the way uh so I'm really excited for the leadership of the sheriff's office to change. I just wish it was changing to someone a little more progressive uh, and a little more reform oriented. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of inertia to these kinds of organizations too. So if it's been this, this long with bad policy, <clears throat> even if the right person came in, it would probably take them a good little while to, to turn that ship, you know? It would most definitely, um, but someone's got to start the turning, right? Like the 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 big ship takes a while to turn, but you've got to start the turn at some point um, before you hit the rocks or the the iceberg. Um, so we shall see. Um, and in four years, you know, there's another bite at the apple, and who knows who's out there who wants to run for sheriff uh, at that point? Because maybe things go even further south, and we need a new sheriff in town. Um, I was waiting to say that all week. All right, <laughs> or, or at least since, or at least since yesterday. <laughs> at least since yesterday. All right. Well, that was leading off. Um, so thank you. For, thank you for that. Uh, you keep, we'll keep an eye on that story so you don't have to, and we'll bring it to you uh, on future down ballots as we find out more from the trial. Um, but uh, we'll stick in the public safety sphere if that's okay with you, producer Dave, for our next story. I mean, that's, what, that's what it says on the piece of paper in front of me. So, Right. So we're going to move into winners and losers, um, where uh, even if there are winners, they're typically not the people we want to win, um, but mostly there's losers. Uh <laughs> And speaking of losers, the police union in San Jose, uh, they are a little upset because uh, over the weekend there were a couple of shootings in San Jose and they feel like uh, if the police department had been adequately staffed, perhaps one of them could have been prevented, I guess. I don't know. We're going to hear more from them in this piece. About the police response to all of the 911 calls for help. The police union is asking why mutual aid was not requested. KTV's Jesse Gary joins us now live with the department's answer. Jesse. The head of the department's official response is that additional resources were not needed, but the police union has a much different take, and they say public safety was and is at risk. The San Jose PD failed every miserably major city at that base, is basic and why I know Monday, a figurative and literal split in perception between the San Jose Police Department and its unionized officers. This weekend, we were very busy with several high-priority events. The divide centers on multiple emergency calls from Saturday night through early Sunday morning. A lot of crying of women just crying or something that I didn't know what was happening at the time. Officers responded to at least five instances of shots fired and three stabbings. The crime scenes stretch from east to south to north to near downtown. Our patrol officers uh, handled everything, uh, responded to these calls. When someone calls 911, the police should answer that call. The San Jose PD failed miserably. The Police Officers Association says dozens of additional 911 calls went unanswered for hours due to a shortage of officers. Despite requiring overtime from so-called swing shift and third shift officers, some portions of America's 10th largest city had no police officers available for service. San Jose PD failed. People died. And we need to know why. Today, we are calling for an investigation into why city leaders did not request mutual aid. San Jose's mayor and city manager both say such a request must come from the police chief. In a statement, the department says, we did not conclude that the amount of calls required assistance from any allied agency. We had over 100 officers handling and assisting with all the major incidents. I've never been working a shift where the calls were so out of hand that we had to call in another allied agency. Brass points to the George Floyd protests from 2020 as an example of the last time mutual aid was needed. But the officers' union says with some of its members forced to work 16 hours or more, additional outside resources were needed this past weekend. City leaders are working our officers far too long, too often, and it's putting the public safety at risk and officers at risk. 
There's no word on if there will be a formal investigation or which department would lead it. And if you were wondering about officers coming out of the police academy, the union says of the 112 who have graduated so far this year, only 61 are still on the force, and they are poised to lose even more officers than that by the end of this year due to retirement and resignation for better opportunities elsewhere. We're live outside San Jose Police Headquarters in San Jose. Jesse Gary, KTVU, Fox 2 News. We'll head back to you up in Oakland. All right. Thanks, Jesse, for that report. Well, at least. I, I just see, like, yeah. crime statistics from other cities with a million people, and this just. I just don't. I'm just not. Just not buying this crap. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, to be honest, violent crime um, in San Jose and other cities is on the rise. Uh, not like any sort of exponential spike, right? It's just it's up. Um, but property crime continues to be down um, across the board and continues to trend down. And violent crime will trend down again, too. There is a spike happening right now for whatever for variety of reasons, whatever reason. Um, but once again, it's being used. Um, police staffing levels are being used for political purposes. Um, I'm not going to say gain because God knows right now this is a really hot, hot potato issue and there's just as i mean I, I think that the majority of folks out there voters especially regular voters are more your you know public safety rah rah kind of sis boom bob you know maybe not fly the blue lives matter flag out front but certainly you know put the police sticker in their car right and like and uh you know support the boys and girls in blue uh for the most part, right? I think there's a growing contingent of us out there that's a little more skeptical um, and should be and has always been there. But uh, at the end of the day, most people like public safety, they like cops, right? Um, so right now you're seeing this being used across the board as a political wedge issue. You just saw one of the candidates for sheriff standing with the POA, um, who endorsed him, by the way, um, and uh, calling shame on you, right? Um, and, th and really, it's this is nobody's, well, there's no one person's fault. And there's no one entity you can put the blame, uh, point point the finger at or put the blame on. Um, it's a systemic problem. It's a long it's a long term problem, and we're not going to solve it overnight. And it also didn't necessarily cause this incident. So I just want to talk a little bit about the uptick in violent crime. Uh, violent crime since the mid '90s, especially in the cities, has been on a very long downward trend. I think a lot of people, when talking about this, suffer from the inability to zoom out on a chart. Um, it's going to drop back down if, unless we've just hit the point and we're at the bottom. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. If we're right. just at an at or near the bottom, then the only place to go is up and then back down to the bottom, and then up and then back down to the bottom again. And in that right. case, it's like in that case that's the best place you're ever going to be. Right. I've got science. I've got some science for you in a graph. Like, check it out. Check it out. See, like up here, this is where people like, this is the zoom in, right? This is like, Ooh, it's going up. Right. <laughs> and this is the long-term view, right? Like it's down, 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 down. Oh, it's, it's up a little bit. Yeah, it'll go back down, but we're like right here. Right. And the same, that's where right there, right there. That's the difference you're talking about. And you're, you're exactly right. Um, Folks need to take the long, long view. We talked a lot about during the, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I blathered on a lot during last week's episode uh, as Mr. Mahan was putting the blame for the police stabbing shortage. And we're going to hear more about that in a second here um, on Cindy Chavez and former councils for giving away the farm in pension deals to public employees and talking about the long term liability, right? And yeah, if you take, if you narrowly focus right now, right, the money's not there. If you look at it in the long term, the money is there. And that's the point of a pension system and what people just, they, 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 I think they understand this. They're smart enough to understand this, but they use it as a wedge issue. They use, and they use staffing levels like this as a wedge issue to say that someone, whoever's in charge is wrong. Whoever's in charge is responsible um, and, and is doing something wrong. So in this case, it's, you know, Sam Licardo, it's the police chief. Um, so the unions who hate Licardo um, and are pushing Bob Johnson are going to be out there, you know, harping on this and saying that they're, that the city's screwing up. Um, and Matt Mahan will be out there saying that the county and the sheriff are screwing up and not coming to our aid, right? Um, and that uh, you know, the the city, um, you know, the, the, the city <laughs> saying that the city uh, needs more help from from everyone else, right? San Jose can't can't uh, carry its own weight. So, 
Not for nothing with everything we've been hearing about the county and the, the, the sheriff's department since we started doing this show. I'm not really sure that's the entity you would like to have come to your aid. They seem pretty corrupt. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, they, actually, more likely, Matt Mayhem would just criticize the, the sheriff for not reaching out in the first place or, or, re, or stepping up in the first place or just not being competent enough to enlist in the first place. Um, he has a great he's done a great job of criticizing the county when he's running while he's running for city mayor. Um, so. Well, it's just a lot easier to run on. We need to change things because things are broken. Then we're actually doing a pretty good job. Here's some of the places where we need to do a little bit better, but we're actually yeah. not doing anything different than we were five years ago. So maybe circumstances have changed and we need to make some adjustments. People start to fall asleep when they start hearing a message like that, even though yes. that's a much more accurate message and it's a much more positive message about your community. Sure. I um, mean, it's really a message that I, I think Matt Mahan could run on, frankly, if he wanted to, because he's in, he is endorsed by the, the only person on the city council that's endorsed him besides you know, who's not running for mayor is the mayor. Um, all the other nine council members, conservative, progressive, whatever you want to call them, um, is endor are endorsing Cindy Chavez. Um, and there's good reason for that. He just doesn't play well with others. But the mayor is supporting him. So and this is the mayor who's been the mayor for eight years. He pretty much carried on the policies of the mayor before him. So pretty much the last 16 years of policymaking um, it, it is endorsing this guy. And he's also, you know, pr pledging to pretty much carry forward a lot of the same kind of attitude and policies. And yet he is, is using the rhetoric of the city is fucked. We're completely off track. It's going to hell in a handbasket. You should be scared for your life. Someone's going to come and invade your home and, and you know, rape your children and put sugar in your gas tank. And only I can fix it. Cause I ran a business. Um, I ran a tech business and, uh, it, it, the irony just escapes most people because most people don't understand it, but it's like, you're getting most of your support from the person you're criticizing from the, you're saying that they've led us all astray somehow because they're in charge. They're the one, he's the one in charge. Um, so you're trying to, you, you're, you're trying to run on that legacy and yet run away from it at the same time. And while we get that. You know, the insiders get the people who follow this get that. Unfortunately, most voters aren't going to get that. But that's sort of where things are standing. We're going to hear a little bit more about it here in the next story. But just to, just to front load it, um, it's become a, it, it always has been, but it's certainly a big wedge issue, wedge issue right now. And sadly, I'll tell you this, Producer Dave, sadly, Cindy Chavez is buying right into the rhetoric. And try, and to, you saw it on, in that, I'm sure you saw more of it in that, uh, after I left in that uh, forum where she's like doubling down on the same kind of rhetoric, like safe, clean city, right? Like trying to outflank him or something like, oh, I need to have my own, you know, tough on crime rhetoric, right? To, to counter his. It's like, no, you should be yourself and be true to what, where we, what, who we want you to be, which is a champion for progressive values and for reform and for, yeah, don't be afraid to say defund the police. Don't be afraid to embrace the, the that movement, Black Lives Matter, because... Frankly, you're going to win more points that way and create more of a distinction between you and the other person. Right now, they look kind of the same person on this issue, and that's that's disappointing because they're not. Police staffing, they're not. one of the key issues in the race to become San Jose's next mayor. Current Santa Clara County Supervisor Cindy Chavez is running against a relative newcomer to politics, freshman city council member Matt Mahon. Now, Katie Nielsen sat down with both of these candidates on where they stand when it comes to public safety. Nikki Edwards was born and raised in San Jose. She works as a realtor and lives in the quiet Rose Garden community on the city's west side with her husband and two small children. She says she's seeing an increase in crime in her neighborhood. On my own street, there was, um, it looked like a drug drop off and then they started doing drugs right out in the open. She says she- Okay, stop. <laughs> um, okay. I don't think they're gonna dox her street. This lady is our neighbor literally one block over on the same street. I, 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 I'm anxious to hear what she thinks of our neighborhood. <laughs> 911, but it took more than two hours before police showed up. That's concerning. That's just because that's not an emergency. Correct. Correct. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, we have in this city right now, 950 ish sworn officers ready to go who are street ready, right? We have 1,100 positions that are available. We only have 950 officers that are ready. That's less than like one for every thousand residents, one for every 10,000 residents, something like that. I forget what the ratio is. It's well below the ratios of any other major city in America. Like it's like half of most of them, right? Um, so we have 
triage where if the crime is not happening like right now, if your house is not being robbed right now, if the person is not in your house, the thief is not there right now. Yeah, the cops aren't coming right now. I'm sorry. Like they have bigger shit to do. They will come later or a community service officer will come later and take a report from you. Right. And, and, and you should definitely file a report, but they're not coming unless shit's happening like right now. Right. Or you're being assaulted. So I saw someone, I think I saw someone doing drugs. Isn't an emergency. Correct. Well, I'm mean, say that's not even an emergency period, right? That's not even a crime that you, know, you, you really should be reporting. I think I saw someone. That's like a next door post. Right. Like put it on next door where it belongs. Correct. Nikki. Was it a suspicious person? It's not something it was probably someone that brown. I've ever had to deal with in the past. Or, or black. Mayoral candidates Matt Mahan and Cindy Chavez say they're concerned about police response times and both blame the problem on a lack of police staffing, especially for a city the size of San Jose. San Francisco has a population of around 800,000 people and has 1,955 sworn police officers. This is misleading too because in the middle of the day on a Wednesday, there's way more people than 800,000 in San Francisco. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It, uh, it, it's very true. And not so much in San Jose, actually. San Jose goes down as far as the daytime population. But the nighttime population is is higher than San Francisco's, for sure. Uh, it depends. Friday, Saturday night, maybe not, because all the clubs and stuff, all the entertainment. Well, okay, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. Where San Jose's population is right around 1 million people, with 1,092 sworn officers. Actually, here, so, here pause it really quick. Um, more like apples to apples is actually, if you look at just San Jose staffing over time, we actually have fewer officers now than we did 10, 12, 12 years ago before pre, pre-recession, pre right? So 15 years ago. And there's 100,000 more people in the city than there were 15 years ago. So anyway, but I think it's a better, it's better apples to apples comparison. Where they differ is in how many more the city needs and how to pay for them. We're spending for between 40 and $50 million a year over the last few years in overtime. And if you're spending that much in overtime, you can certainly take a portion of that and apply it to full-time ongoing policing. Chavez has been endorsed by the San Jose Police Officers Union and in recent debates has suggested adding 45 new officers each year. Mahan says the city is already struggling with unfunded debt to pay for large retirement packages already owed to current officers. And the city needs to be more strategic about growing the tax base before adding additional liabilities. I will make police staffing a priority, but I will not do it in a way that is unsustainable and pushes off the burden of ser- future service cuts to future generations. San Jose's next mayor will be a key player in negotiations with the police officers union on a new contract. Right now, the union is asking for a 14 percent pay raise over the next two years. I have looked at the numbers, and if we were to agree to the 14 percent increase, we would begin growing the unfunded liabilities once again. Chavez would not specifically comment on the neg- negotiations, but said it's important the salaries for San Jose officers are competitive. I'd want to make sure it was something that we could do budgetarily, and I'd want to make sure it still created room for us to be able to hire more officers. And I'd want to better understand how it would assist us with retention. After a number of high-profile misconduct cases within the department over the past year, both candidates are calling for increased oversight. Do you believe that police should be investigating themselves? Having some civilian oversight uh, makes a lot of sense to me. It also makes sense to me that the district attorney's office would continue to play a significant role in investigations. We have that independent police audit function that is able to investigate complaints so that the public can trust that we are not simply leaving the department to police itself. How the next mayor addresses the public safety issues will have a huge impact on residents like Nikki, both in terms of her community and also her livelihood. This is definitely a a big issue. It's of the utmost importance that we come together as a community and get out there and vote and uh, do whatever we can to support the safety of our own people and where we live. In San Jose, Katie Nielsen, KPIX5. And, and she's definitely voting for Matt Mahan. I, I suppose so. I, I don't know because it seems like the police officers union is supporting Cindy Chavez, which seems it is. odd. Oh, not it's not terribly. I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's taking the long view, <laughs> stepping back. Um, yeah, I know it's definitely not odd at all. Uh, they are still a union um, and uh, labor is 100% uh, on board with city Chavez because at the end of the day, they're talking about the next police contract, right? Um, she'll be more, but be- she'll be a much better, uh, broker with them than Matt Mayhem would be right. They get, they get shit on if Matt Mayhem is the, is the mayor. 
That said, he doesn't. He won't have a council majority, so the majority might still be able to overturn him, but they're not going to have an honest broker in him at all. So they would much, 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 much rather have Cindy Chavez to deal with on their contract, um, even if she is like the more progressive uh, Democrat, right, uh, in the race. Um, she's also not a died in the wool reformer either or a defund the police or, or even a, I, I wouldn't even classify her as like a black lives matter apologist or whatever you want to call it right I, she's not a so she's she's social justice oriented she's not a social justice warrior so um uh, it, it's it you know it's yet to be seen how things will actually play out if either one of these people get elected um but i don't think either of them are being very genuine to who they are in this race i think they're both tacking to the middle on a lot of the key issues um, and then attacking each other on the periphery around like values, right? Around like abortion rights or the whole thing with the NRA and the gun rights that, uh, that, that Chavez is hitting, uh, Mahan on, um, right now you'll see it in your mailbox. Go check it out right now. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's, it's, dis- it's just disappointing. We, we could have such a better contrast, um, and we're just getting more of the same. So I, I think that maybe the police don't want to be paid in a picture of an ape that's on the blockchain and so they uh, are like worried that matt mayhan will be like yeah but have you heard about nfts like <laughs> 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 did you know that if you would have invested your salary in bitcoin <laughs> i'm speaking of salary by the way I, w- I do want to point out in that story well hello focus um hello camera uh the that they're talking about police salary increases not pension increases or not not a uh, not uh city obligations to the pension fund increases things like that so just just to be clear there they're talking about salary um i don't think a 14 percent increase is sustainable either but it's not going to hurt the unfunded liability if that increase were to come if that comes out of the general fund also like unfunded liability is like kind of weaselly because it's just talking yes. about bills we're going to have to pay in the future and it doesn't really account for um unrealized revenue correct so it's like you know i have unfunded liabilities into the millions for the rest of my life if you want to you know what i'm saying like (laughs) yeah no for sure that uh it's it's a bugaboo it's an absolute bugaboo that's used to discredit public employees and attack them and use it for political gain and it's a trope that's been used for days and days and days by white men after white man after white man. And I think I'm, I'm just kind of sick of white men running my city, frankly. And as much as I don't, you know, I'm not like a city Chavez acolyte, right? I think she's a decent person when it comes down to it. Um, and she'd be a great mayor, but um, I'm, I'm all on board because I just can't stand the thought of more of this bullshit. Um, uh, and I, I don't care if he believes it or not, it's bullshit. And I mean, my, my bias on this is pretty clear. I feel like one of the things that one of the broader things that I like that I talk about uh, politically on all of our shows is the influence of big tech, not just on our local politics, but on the society and culture of the fucking planet. And I don't think that a guy who sold his first business to Facebook or in his second business to Pinterest is going to be a net good for our city for our, for the people of our state and for the people of our planet, just based on what I've seen before from people coming out of this industry and gaining power via business or any other way that they do. Uh, I joke that this guy st- smells like Peter Thiel. I don't actually believe that Peter Thiel is funding this guy's campaign. I found no evidence of that. It's just, he's just that kind of, kind of, he just, it just feels like he feels like blake masters kind of it's just it's a vibe Mm -hmm. it's not it's not anything around policy or any of the things that he's he's saying that he's going to do it's just it's just more of the same more i've met a million of him at like dinner parties and i just like avoid these people at dinner parties i don't like san jose has a lot of different people in it and we don't need these people that look like they came out of the boardroom of a tech company like sam licardo yeah. looks like he came out of the boardroom of maybe yahoo because he's a little older you know so <laughs> yeah well these both they both came out of the same high school i mean uh sam and, and matt uh maybe a few years apart but they're they're cut from the same cloth regardless of where they say they come from they both tell you they'll both tell you they come from the cut they come from immigrant families <laughs> and worked you know working class families and you know it's true to some extent it's their narrative it's, but it's their it's the truth to some extent but it's a narrative um and it's it's a it's a trope it's just a way to a way to make them paint themselves as 
you know, more of the people than they really are. I'm just telling you on Matt Mahan, I'm waiting for that endorsement from Andrew Yang's super PAC to drop. That's going to be the nail in the coffin for me to be like, this guy should never be in charge of anything. Well, I don't know if it's coming one week left, so probably not happening anytime soon. Um, we shall see. Anyway, sorry, I've got a little soft fo- soft porn focus on my camera right now. I'll fix that during the next clip. <laughs> don't worry. If, if you can't fix it, don't worry about it. This is. The ch- the, but the chat needs to see my lovely face, so... <laughs> Anyway, what's it's up with the, me, though. what's up with the hot dog business in San Francisco or in San Jose? I'm San, sorry. San Jose. Well, obviously, because there's just not enough cops. Um, you know, crime. Basically, crime, crime, crime. Uh, but, uh, I definitely want to go. Has had enough with crime and vandals. Mark's Hot Dogs has been in East San Jose since 1936, but for the past two years, it's had to raise prices and significantly uh, cut back hours because of neighborhood issues. Here's NBC Barrio Stephanie Magallon. It's a little dark out right now, but this is San Jose's famous hot dog spot, Mark's Hot Dogs, where I'm told that employees are constantly being attacked, clients are being carjacked, and they're dealing with break-ins. It's been 86 years of friendships and hot dogs, but now, overshadowed by crime, this East San Jose icon is on the verge of closing down. Well, something you work your whole life for, you know. For me, it's emotional. McLean says in the past five years, the homeless population, security issues, and vandals have significantly increased in the Alum Rock neighborhood. We've had situations where they just come in and we've had carjackings where kids will run in there to hide out. We've had people that were just sitting here and people being robbed at, right in front of the customers and stuff. He also says they found naked men in the back, women sleeping in their restroom, and others just coming to break their property. They used to close at 8 or 10 p.m., but now they're closing at 4 on weekdays and 6 on weekends, which means fewer sales and hours for employees. Sad, just because, you know, this has been around for so long, and we would I would just hate for it to, like, close down because of a problem that should be solved, <laughs> could be solved. The city councilmen will come here and have lunch and want us to support them and all that, but nothing from them at all. We reached out to the council member Magdalena Carrasco's office, but we have not heard back yet. Tonight, all they ask for is help to keep this landmark alive for another eight decades. In San Jose, Stephanie Magallon, NBC Bay Area News. Alma Den? What was that? In the, oh, this is in- the east side. This is on the east side. Okay, because they said Alma Den. Cap- uh, yeah, Capitol Avenue on the east oh, side. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, they say. Oh, Magdalena Carrasco is the uh, the councilwoman, so they reached out to her to for a comment, but having her back, I'm shocked. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's it, but you know, it is what it is. It, uh, we saw this. We saw Peter's Bakery, which is an iconic bakery on the east side, broken into, um, and then businesses all over the city being vandalized and 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 uh, traumatized. But um, you know, like like we've talked about a lot. It's a big city, and uh. You know, there's only so much that can be done, and if that dude is expecting the city council to help him, like solve his problem, his crime problem here, the naked people in his backyard, women sleeping in his bathroom, um, people breaking in to like I don't know, get food, um, you know, he's gonna be waiting a long time. So uh, I I would say maybe up your game on the security side of things, maybe rebrand a little bit, like or or uh, re you know revive the brand a bit it's an iconic spot like it's a place where low riders used to congregate um before cruises it could be again now that the cruising ban has been lifted uh so you know maybe like think about you know marketing it up and getting more people there you more eyes and people on a space the you know the less you're going to see as far as crime and and the less desirable elements because they'll go somewhere else where no maybe not as many people are watching right yeah, I, I've never been to this spot, and I'm not really familiar with the neighborhood, so I don't really have too terribly much to say here. But again, I think it's just, again, it's like a, if to the extent that there is like an uptick in crime, it's just uh, minor, and everybody's just going to have to ride it out. Yeah, I think I was just really hungry, and that's why I saw the I saw the story and wanted to have it on the ballot, but or on the, on the docket for down ballot. Well, the down ballot docket, the down docket. Uh, in other news, uh, people are pissed in San Francisco, Producer Dave. Can you believe it? Again? Yeah, and it's over like a fucking garden. Oh, of course. 
<laughs> a community Usually garden. any greenery is welcomed in the city, but a new urban garden is sparking debate in San Francisco. At issue is this Mission District lot that some neighbors use for parking. But now a group of so-called guerrilla gardeners say the area should be used as a green space. Now, adding to the debate, it's not really clear who owns the space. Here's NBC Barry at Sergio Quintana. The lot is pretty unique in the city. It's a diagonal strip of land that used to be a path for the railroad. In fact, there's still rails embedded in the ground here. Right now, several vehicles are parked here, but now there's also a lot of newly added planter boxes. A group called Green Space cut the lock on one of the fences and set them up here this weekend. You know, it's it's radical in the sense of going down to the root of what is effective. And if what we need is access to the space to shape its future, then cutting the chain was the next step. Elizabeth Creeley is part of the Green Space Group. They've been holding meetings about access to the lot for years, but they decided to take action this weekend. And along with installing planting boxes, they've also put up signs on the fence asking people not to park here anymore. At least one neighbor, who didn't want to be shown on camera, supports the group's effort. Other people, I don't think they have more right to the space than I do. Um, they just park their cars and it doesn't really get used. It gets locked at night. The people who have access include residents whose homes border the lot and teachers at the Mission Kids Co-op. The co-director says they drive in from Oakland and other parts of the Bay and teach primarily Spanish and English speaking kids in the neighborhood. The co-op is not opposed to a green space here, but... I think that there are a few members of the community that have an idea of, of what should happen with the space and we would like to see broader community input. According to the city of San Francisco, this lot is actually three different parcels and someone or someone's representative has been paying the taxes on one of those parcels, but it's actually in the middle. And that makes this a little more complicated. We have all kinds of things that go back to the 1800s, claims that go back to the 1800s, uh, fake deeds. We have uh, lawsuits that were uh, won and lost, and still we have no owner for uh, two, at least two of the parcels. The two unknown parcels are where the chain link fences were set up. And if the city doesn't know who owns the land, it cannot declare who has the right to access the land. Other portions of this rail corridor, like the park across Treat Street, have already been turned into green spaces, but if there's no clear owner, it's also nearly impossible for the city to turn this lot into anything else. So for now, the debate goes on. In San Francisco, Sergio Quintana, NBC, Bay Area News. That's crazy. Nobody, uh, 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 if you would have told me there's a, there's a spot in like urban San Francisco that nobody knows who owns it, I'd be like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, that's, that was wild, actually. Uh, I mean, it's not so terribly surprising. You'll find, man, in land use, uh, all sorts of random uh, covenants and documents and deeds going back ages, right? Some of them, you don't know if they're forged or what they are, but like old, you know, handwritten documents that's, you know, uh, that declare property rights. And it makes you wonder and makes you realize how specious and how silly property rights are in the first place, right? <laughs> like, um, like, oh, I'm, I'm, this is mine, this is my land. It's like, sure okay bro um and in a million years you know it's not going to be here anymore right because just you know the world churns it's not your land like you know no one owns that space um we all own it um we're all here to you know we're all in this together just because you own that little like this parcel right just because someone owns one piece of it doesn't mean the other two pieces don't affect what happens on their parcel right or doesn't affect them in some way that this does not affect them of course it affects them in some way I mean, if we don't know who oh. owns the rest of it, why don't we just give a mulligan to whoever owns the piece in the middle? I mean, you know, like, right. I don't know what else to say. And, like, and, and, and frankly, you know, if, uh, if this spurs, if this, you know, green space group, like, you know, and their, their bold move here to just break into the space, if it spurs a conversation around who fucking owns the space, then all, all more power to them, right? Maybe they'll find the owner. Maybe they'll be like, oh shit, I didn't even realize I own that land. Um, and they'll want to like say, hey, let's let's create a fucking huge urban garden. The whole, you know, the whole property can be an urban garden and you can all p play a part in it and everyone can have a little plot. Or, you know, they'll say we want to redevelop it and build affordable housing and make a bunch of money. If I owned if I owned that thing, I'd be like, oh, shit, sell it. Yeah, right. Condos. We well, you you decide. I'm I'm sorry for whatever happens here afterwards because it's not going to be great. But you know what right. I like money. Yeah, exactly. And the condo developers will give you lots of it. Because San Francisco property, San Francisco land, Bay Area land in general is valuable. Just FYI.
Yeah, I don't huh. even, I have no idea. I don't know where that is. I have no idea. Like, it looked like it was like a piece of land that would be very hard to actually develop on just because of what it, what's there and what's next to it. It's it's odd. It's definitely one of the, it, it's something, I forget what the phrase, there's a phrase in land use for parcels like that that are just oddly shaped. I forget what it is off the top of my head. I used to hear it a lot in the planning commission, but yeah, it's, it's a very difficult to develop space right it's very it's very very odd so you're not going to get a lot of value out of it anyway which is probably why it's sitting vacant right because they're probably not paying it's probably been in family for generations they're not paying a hell of a lot of property tax on it so they might as well keep it vacant and just see what happens it's like a speculation you know uh, long term um so nothing's being done and probably probably saves them money in the long term not having to upkeep it more uh develop the piece of land uh well Shall we find out what happened uh the Antioch mayor from himself? We heard a little bit of a preview of it, I think, recently on Down Ballot, but uh, the Antioch mayor was assaulted recently. Have you heard about this? Um, Yeah, this is one of those stories that we said we were going to keep an eye on, and I think in this case we actually did. Dude, we're keeping an eye on it. I hear my name. I hear someone yelling, uh, Lamar, where have you been at? Lamar, where have you been at? And so I turn around and I notice uh, this gentleman who I recognized. Antioch Mayor Lamar Thorpe had just wrapped up a speech on Tuesday during an event at the Lone Tree Golf Course and was heading to the parking lot. Sources tell NBC Bay Area that's when Antioch resident Thomas McNell began yelling the mayor's name. McNell is one of the local residents who signed a petition attempting to recall the mayor late last year. So, the mayor uh, claims well, McNell brought that up on Tuesday, unhappy with remarks the mayor made towards him during a 4th of July celebration. Remarks the mayor didn't deny. And I walked by him and his wife, who were sitting down, and I asked them, how did the signature gathering effort go? Uh, because- oh, oh, I like him. Oh, trolling. <laughs> I like Very him. Very nice. Very nice. Who initiated the recall, but at that point it had failed miserably. That's when the mayor says a shouting match turned into a face to face confrontation. And when the mayor claims McNell allegedly got physical, put his hand in a fist like this, mm-hmm. but he hit me with this side of his fist, you know, where the pinky is. And he went like that to my chest right here. Mayor Thorpe uh, claims he so blocked the second punch before colleagues time, jumped in to break things up. We spent all day trying to reach Thomas McNell to get his side of the story, but he hasn't responded. The Antioch police say it's all under investigation, with Interim Police Chief Stephen Ford saying in a statement they are taking the case very serious and are exhausting all resources as elected officials should never feel threatened or in harm's way. They are actively gathering all the facts and will submit them to the district attorney's office for final review. As the investigation continues, the mayor says disagreements are a part of the job, but this latest incident Leaves them feeling a bit uneasy. You know, I, I don't always anticipate that they're going to get physical, but obviously I can't. That's no longer the case. In Antioch, Pete Serratos, NBC Barry and News. Sounds like other dude does not know how to throw a punch at all. Right. <laughs> Let's get physical. Yeah. Uh, guy, I, I mean, I can't say that I'm like some sort of expert on fighting and, and, and hand-to-hand combat, but, you know... Uh, Sounds, sounds a little weak to me. A little, little punch and Judy action. Um, well, I mean, that's I do good, like though. The, I mean, right? Isn't it good, kind of, that the other guy didn't know how to throw a punch and there wasn't really much of a physical altercation to uh, to really speak of here? Yeah, it could have gotten really bad, too. Um, so, But if it had gotten really bad, then guy might be in more trouble. Um, but good, good on the mayor for that troll job. That was fantastic. I only wish I'd be that cool. I just feel like... I don't know. I mean, there were other people around and it got broken up real quick. And the guy did like a, like backwards almost punch with the, with the soft part of his hand. So he wasn't going to hurt anybody. I'm glad, I'm glad that's the case, I suppose. But like, don't go around assaulting people. But if you're now, that's it. That's all. That's it. That's the end of my statement. I I mean, yeah, don't, don't touch another person, uh, in, you know, even in jest in some sort of aggressive manner, right? Like just don't do it. It's a good, idea. good rule of thumb, Austin Bennett. Uh, just don't <laughs> steer clear of that. But it does sound as though like the guy, maybe, maybe he didn't intention. Maybe was, he was thinking of it like a bro tap, right? Like, darn you, mayor, you got me this time. I'll get you. If it wasn't for these bastard kids. Um, oh wait, <laughs> that's not what Scooby-Doo would say. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll keep an eye on it. We'll see if there's a, if he ends up pressing charges, um, I doubt it. I think he would have already. I think he's just going for the 
public sympathy, the the TV spot, you know, maybe run for county supervisor. Or just to kind of let I people can, know that, I mean, this is going on. I mean, maybe people in the community, right. like, he's like, well, maybe people do need to know this is going on here and that this right. sort of uptick in, like, violent rhetoric and, you know, violence that's happening to politicians that are on the national level is also happening on occasion locally. And, that, that you know, maybe it's the right thing for people in Antioch to know that, you know, had had this been a different scenario, that there could have been a brawl, like, right. over over a petition that didn't work. I mean, come on. Well, it's also worth noting that the, the mayor is black, right? You can't ignore that. Right. Um, and that's certainly, I'm I'm almost 100% certain that's a factor here too. Um, so whether or not we can call this a hate crime or not is one thing, but it's certainly a factor um, uh, in this, I'm sure, uh, given the... Speaking of the, the North, speaking of the sort of Northeast ish Bay and uh, race relations, it seems like uh, an entire county full of people need to get their shit together. Seriously, is any any I might even be in count across the county. I'm not terribly familiar with my my northeast Bay Area geography, but uh, let's find out what's going on there. Under uh, get your shit together. Contra Costa County is entrenched in white supremacy. That's the finding Ooh. from the first report from the newly formed Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. It's sparking a lot of heated discussion within the county. Here's NBC Bay Area's Pete Serratos. In Contra Costa County. There's been, as across our country, there's been a history of institutional racism. Contra Costa um, County I Supervisor John Joya is one of the co-chairs of the county's newly and formed the, the Office of Racial exists, Equity and Social Justice. It was authorized back in 2020 at the height of nationwide social justice demonstrations. And after nearly two years of speaking with residents impacted by racial disparities, a 53-page report with recommendations for next steps was presented to the county's board of supervisors. Perception is the reality to some people. Karen Mitchoff is the chair of the board and expressed her displeasure with a specific line of the report, which said Contra Costa County was, quote, entrenched in white supremacy. She says she fully supports the new department, but took issue with what she feels is an inaccurate description of the county. White supremacy to most people means David Duke, George Wallace, Adolf Hitler, farmer, followers of, of the former president. They do not mean the residents of Contra Costa. The former president. But committee members at today's meeting say it refers to a much larger systemic issue that they hope the office can address. Those of us from um, structurally burdened communities, white supremacy does have a different meaning. The board eventually agreed to accept the report, but will require the authors to add more context to explain the white supremacy statement. They will also move forward with recommendations to hire directors and create more oversight of equity measures across county departments. Supervisor Joya says he hopes the board can move past any disagreements on the terms used in the report and start addressing the root cause of the issues. But white supremacy doesn't just mean um, extreme right wing Nazi sympathizers. It means systems, government systems that are racist in Contra Costa County, Pete Serratos, NBC Barry. And I liked the older woman who was like, I like that we're doing this, but I don't like that. We did this. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like the NIMBY arguments right around like a, well, I, you know, I really want, we need to do everything we can to help the homeless and to help people off the street. Oh, you want to build it in my neighborhood. Oh Yeah. Maybe not. That's not the right spot for it. Maybe like over there. Right. I want, I, I joined this committee, but I didn't know that it was going to, uh, uh you know, right. do what we said it was going to do actually. And right. take a look at the systems and she like her, her view of, of white supremacy and racism is like a cartoonized view of it. Oh, completely. It's, it's just the, it, the reaction is so white privilege or white uh, fragility if you've read the if anyone has read or heard the book right um i actually we if the good wife and i listen to the book it's so much better listening than reading that book honestly because the person who's narrating the the audible version of that book it's uh, it's just it, they, there's like irony just exuding from their voice it's so beautiful but if you read it you, this is a, a classic response of defensive white people like oh 
Well, I, I, I commissioned this report to see if we were racist. I didn't actually expect to get called a racist. Um, shit. What, you know, I'm not a racist. Well, I'm and, the least racist person I know. And, and I mean, not for nothing, somebody who joins that, that commission is probably one of the people who's least likely to be doing the, the majority of the con- contribution to the big problem. It's just mm-hmm. that they, it's just that they, they see like terms like white supremacy and they like internalize and personalize it as if it's about them yes. as an individual where right. like, that's just, you, you, we can't possibly look at this stuff that way. Right. Otherwise, I mean, everyone. Frankly, otherwise, everyone's just going to walk around with what they are, what they colloquial call white guilt, and nobody's going to yeah. fucking do anything. Yeah, and I mean, like, white, white people, white people in general should. I, I think they should internalize this and really re- and reflect on it in some way, right? But not in a way of defensiveness or not a way of like rejecting it or thinking of it as like something, um, even something bad. Frankly, right? Like mo- uh, a lot of us, most of us. Uh, we have these, this privilege, we have these, uh, racist instincts, we have these prejudices and these biases, we have them, right? Nothing, and, and there's nothing that's in, inherently wrong with having the bias, because you, in, in a lot of ways you can't control that bias. What you can control is what you do with the bias and what you do after the fact and what you do with your, you know, with your actions and your, your thoughts and your values, right? Um, that's where you control things. So I'd, I think it's, if, if this is obviously a defensive reaction, because she just didn't like the fact, <laughs> didn't like the idea of being lumped in with you know adolf hitler and you know all these but well yeah yeah this has this therefore that like that this is a direct through line absolutely just because it was more overt you know with hitler doesn't mean it was any you know it, it's, it's any different than what it is now when it's this dog whistle kind of shit right um and it's becoming more overt thanks to our former president so i, I don't know what world she's living in but we're in this is what we're in right this is where, where we're at and, and I, I fully think, accept like, it what you said about attitudes and behavior, right? If you start to change your behavior, I think if you continuously change your behavior and you behave in as non or anti-racist way as you possibly can, I think that over time, just those actions will change your attitude and yes. you, you might start to disabuse yourself of some of your previous notions through positive action. That's the point of anti-racism. Exactly. It's a point of it's a point of going through these exercises and these reports and these studies and task forces. And if people actually paid attention instead of making it like this pro forma, just, you know, oh, I checked the box for DEI. We we checked the box. We did our diversity uh, angle, you know, in our training this year. Um, if you actually took it seriously and, and embodied it, you're right. I think we, we would see attitudes change. But a lot of folks are just sort of going to do the you know, this is going to spread like wildfire. It's, it already has throughout the private and the public sector. I had to take a DEI training the other day for work. Um, but it's all about whether or not we're absorbing it and like really absorbing the lesson as opposed to just sort of going through it to say that we went through it and now we're somehow woke. Right. Yeah. And I mean, just real quick, I, I don't do a lot of anecdotes, but I'll, I'll drop one here. We'll say the husband of a family friend, because we weren't really uh, too keen on the guy. He mm. said a lot of negative things about people in poverty. And then once he retired, <clears throat> he started helping people in his community deal with their social security. And through right. his action in helping people in his community deal with social security, his attitudes about people who have less money than him changed because he engaged in positive civil action for people who were less fortunate than him. And it changed mm-hmm. his mind. And that's yep. how we change our minds. We change our minds through positive action. We don't change our minds through a DEI training or, I mean, DEI training is mostly to cover a company's ass for, for their legal department. We change our, we change our attitudes through positive behaviors. 100% agree. And this would have never, this guy's mind never would have changed if he didn't think it would be a good thing to do in retirement. He probably thought he was going to be helping kind of hoity toity people navigate paperwork. But it, it ended up that he was helping people who were struggling navigate the right. paperwork, and it changed his outlook on the whole situation. And I think mm-hmm. that, I think that, like I said, no amount of trying to explain shit to this guy would have ever done anything. No, nope. not at all. But uh, again, there's 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 woke, and then there's you know sleepwalking. So we're going to go on to down ballot watch, which this week is actually down ballot box bingo. Uh, 
just real quick programming note next week uh down ballot will just kind of extend on into the night as we go into our broader election coverage we'll be trying to cover local elections to the extent we can although the returns don't start coming in until eight but we'll have a general ballot next week and uh, that'll extend on out into uh yours truly and the media wench um nice. covering the election more broadly until um either the republic falls or we just go to bed Nice. Well, I'll try and jump back on as much as I can um, if I'm not too drunk by the t- that time, depending on how the results of the mayor's race are, <laughs> are turning out. Yeah, yeah. It's so, going to be close. So we've got, we're, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit here, make sure we get through everything. We got we, first. We can do a little lightning round here, yeah. So we got sure. first, first here, we got vote early, uh, vote often, but actually just vote once. And this is uh, talking about mail in voting. Decision 2022 now just eight days away, and you've heard the slogan before that every vote counts. But what if you received two ballots? We've heard from a few viewers who tell us they got more than one mail-in ballot. NBC Bears mm-hmm. Ian Cole joins us now. He set out to find out if it's a common problem and what you should do if you got more than one. If you received multiple ballots, don't be alarmed, voting officials say. We spoke with more than one voter off camera who got two in the mail and reached out to us wondering what happened. So we talked with the Santa Clara County Registrar of Voters. It turns out if you moved or changed any part of your address or even updated it at the DMV, you may get a second ballot. And that was the case with our viewers. Which is normal. That is part of the system. We keep record, though. Each ballot has a unique ID number. And the first ballot that we do receive back will be the one that is counted. And if you send in multiple ballots, California counties have systems designed to detect it. Each ballot is scanned in a sorting machine, and that information is captured and recorded. So if any other ballots come in from that voter, the system already knows that one was returned and therefore we will void and not count any additional ballot that's returned from the voter. We don't want voters voting twice. It is illegal to vote twice. And they do refer people who try to vote twice to the district attorney's office. It's also a federal crime. The registrar says very few people try it and investigations find it's usually by accident. Sure, voters who receive two ballots should only return one ballot and they can destroy the other. They want voters to know the system is ready. We are eight days before the election and everything is going very smoothly at this point. In the South Bay, Ian Cole, NBC Bay Area News. So I'm all good with that report, but the, what they forgot to include at the end was that if you have any questions about any of this, the, the county registrar of voters is there to help you. Correct. Not Contact NBC you Bay Area. Anything weird on your ballot, if the address is wrong, if something seems weird about, if something seems out of place, you get two ballots and you don't know what to do, contact the registrar of voters. They have people yes. there who not only will help you, those people want to help you. Correct. So that's uh, for those of you listening, watching, whatever, it's www.sccvote.org is the Santa Clara County Registrar. Their phone number is 833-VOTE. Very easy to remember, 408-833-VOTE. Um, so if you have any questions, give them a call. They will. They are there to help. And I, I thought it was really amusing how they said that you know people got multiple ballots and the first thing they did was call the news. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't really, I know they say, you know, call us, we can help you, Chris Kimura or whatever, but like, I don't see, I, they, they would not be my first call if I got two ballots. If I got two ballots, I would call the number on the ballot, which is the registrar's number and be like, hey, I got two ballots. Um, right, or if anything really seems quite, weird, if there's a misprint on your first yeah. or last name, anything like that, those people at the other yeah. end want to help you. Right. Now, do you think this report did anything to tamp down like conspiracy theorists who hear like, oh, people are getting two ballots and, you know, uh, they're voting for Hillary Clinton. You know, uh, do you think that did anything to tamp down their anxiety or no? No. no. Yeah. Even though it's completely factual, like that th- they're exactly right. You can be t- Tony Romo or M- uh, uh, Mickey Mouse can be registered to vote in Santa Clara County. Um, it doesn't matter. If they don't, you know, they're, they're not going to vote. Mickey Mouse isn't here. He's not going to vote. Like, you can register anyone to vote. I could register a completely fictitious person to vote right now. But if that person doesn't exist and they don't actually vote and they can't prove, you know, they can't show identity, they can't prove all these things and sign the, sign the document, um, you know, the vote's not counted anyway. So, and they don't generally vote. So, just friendly reminder, vote, voter fraud is a complete fucking myth. It's not, doesn't, not, it doesn't happen. It's just so minuscule that it really has it's it's inconsequential right the so. for 
like even if you were trying to turn an election via nefarious methods, in person fraud by a certain by a certain even no matter what number of individuals, the amount of labor to get that going and the paper trail, if you were trying to organize it, the conspiracy you'd have to engage in would get you caught so incredibly quickly that the the vast majority of voter fraud and voter like election fraud is it comes in on the finance level. Mm -hmm. it's that's that's where people get busted is on that money front illegally Correct. giving money giving giving money uh as someone else giving someone else to give money to a politician dinesh d'souza uh <laughs> or using campaign money for personal uses or for even for office uses for for elected official uses or using yeah. your own personal money for your campaign and not reporting it like right. all kinds of stuff sure um no it's you're very right um pretending your election employees aren't your employees, Matt Mahan. Um. <laughs> but yeah, so as you said, if bottom line, if, if you sense anything off, just call the registrar. They are there to help. They are public employees. They're not always the most, you know, speedy and <laughs> efficient, but they are really diligent public employees and they will help you out. So yeah, you don't, call. you don't go work for the registrar of voters for the money. So, right. Right. You do Sorry, two, eight, three vote. Calling. 283 vote. I'm sorry, not 883. 283 vote. So, up next is election influencers are driving the political conversation. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to feel about this. We'll see. We'll see what happens with this story here. They're talking about you. The end of a movie. I like that. I like that music. We are just 20 days away from November's midterm elections, and this year, CBS is diving into the data to give you a snapshot of what is driving the political conversation. We've zeroed in on what we call election influencers. And to help explain what this is and what we've learned from all this, we are joined by Face the Nation moderator, Margaret Brennan. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. What's the genesis of this project? Well, thanks for having me. This is a project that we're excited about because over the course of the past year, CBS has spoken to tens of thousands of potential voters to really kind of understand how they define themselves, where they're coming from. If you want to understand what influences an, an election, you have to understand the motivations of the people casting the ballots. And what we've done is break it down into four different categories. This is responding to what voters are telling us. One of them I think most powerfully described is pressured parents. That's about 13% of likely voters. These are parents who feel pressured from COVID out of control when it comes to being able to protect their kids because of decline in educational standards, because of inflation costs. They're really frustrated with what they've been through. The Democrat and Republican titles aren't describing their experience if, in just DNR. So Trump true believers is another category that we are tracking. It's about 20% of likely voters. This is the center of gravity within the Republican party. They believe they're part of the MAGA movement first, Republican second. Young and the restless, about 6% of voters. These are people under 30 who think the last generation had it much easier than they do. So the question is, will they show up? If they do and they vote, they could be decisive. And the other group we're tracking closely is one you've heard a lot about, the row restorers, people who are motivated by abortion access. They are primarily uh, women and primarily Democratic women, about 24% of voters that we are uh, watching here and Democrats are counting on them in what could be a very tight upcoming <laughs> midterm election. I love this guy that so keeps showing having the struggle to get the ballot in the box. <laughs> this is a little bit different. Who specifically are these influencers right. <laughs> and what can we learn from them? Producer Dave. Well, the idea here is that after Election Day is well behind us, we'll be able to look at the data and understand why a certain party mm -hmm. won the majority and what made the difference this time around. Uh, because it's one thing to say, oh, put it in the R category or the D category, but to be able to say parents here were very motivated by things they were frustrated with in the classroom, for example. We saw education was an issue that was very powerful for Republicans in the state of Virginia. Education. Year, motivating people to turn out. Um, we want to be able to nail down those specifics to understand because America is changing. It has changed mm -hmm. through the trauma we've all been through. And this election, we'll see the first reflection of that. 
It's such a great initiative, I think, Margaret, because it takes it a little bit deeper rather than just looking at the numbers on who voted for who. You're going into the why and what, why they motive, exactly. were motivated to make that decision when they went to the ballot box. It's wonderful. All right, Margaret, thank you so much. It's wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you very much for that deep report on influencers. So I think they ended up talking past each other because the news person was talking about, they were like, who are these influencers? And the person that they were speaking to was like talking about policy issues. And so mm -hmm. I think that they, they just talked past each other because the, it seemed like the news reporter wanted like a Instagram star to be like who they were talking about. Yeah, the, the, it was a local reporter interviewing a national reporter. And I think maybe they both came at it with a different premise for the conversation. <laughs> Good call. Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, I'm going to try and be as much of an influencer as I can with my 1,700 followers on Twitter, um, or well, 31 right now. But you know, I'm, I'm a boy can dream. Uh, so maybe my 31, if my 31 followers all voted for someone, it might swing the election for like dog catcher in District 10. So we got Mister Mister F A B. Um, I don't know who that is, but apparently uh, this is the moderator for an Oakland uh, mayor's candidates forum. And let's let the uh, let's let the local news explain to us what I don't who understand because I'm yeah. uh, <laughs> whack. Wiggity. It's running to be Oakland's next mayor met again tonight to discuss the issues most important to voters and how they plan to address them. As KTVU's LaMonica Peters reports, Oakland rapper and community activist known as Mr. Fab moderated. There you go. Today is about figuring out a way to engage without being enraged. He's rapping. For us to be able to talk about some and community things, engaging. Some uncomfortable things to talk about, but that uncomfortable is necessary. The forum was hosted by Oakland community leader Stanley Cox, also known as Mr. Fab. Dozens of people came out to hear the candidates specifically talk about things like gun violence, homelessness, and reducing crime. When you drive into Oakland, from Emeryville, from San Leandro, from Alameda, you see a stark contrast. There is no way that our town should look the way that it does compared to the city that's right next door. Taylor, Shang Tao, and Ignacio De La Fuente are considered to be front runners, according to a poll recently conducted by the Oakland Chamber of Commerce. Cox also asked the candidates about addressing the educational system and the needs of Oakland's youth. So as your mayor, what I want to do is make sure that we have year-round paid internship for our young people. And when I say young people, that is high school all the way to 30-year-olds. With the election just two weeks away, the candidates zeroed in on turning the city of Oakland around and holding leadership accountable. Only as mayor, you got to set the tone. I want to set the tone. The Oakland is not a dumping ground. People come to Oakland to do things that they don't do anywhere else. Why? Because we let them. Candidates not at tonight's forum include Tyron Jordan, Peter Liu, and John Riemann. LaMonica Peters, KTVU, Fox 2 News. The rhetoric is always about let's turn this city around. It's like, well, when the fuck was this? Like, when, when, when did the city just get to be good? Right, right. Uh, it's almost like it's the, if you believe the rhetoric during campaigns, like you said, it's almost like things never were good. <laughs> where, where is this sort of uh, you know house of these sort of house ion days, the the good old days? You know, it just just seems like every city's going straight to hell, and everyone's going straight to hell, and we need to change things. And everyone at, talks about change, no matter what side of the fence they're on, right, or the or the aisle. It's all about change. It's all about it, whether or not they're you know they're part of the establishment, trying to carry on the establishment, or they they really are trying to reform things. Everyone says they're all about change. Barack Obama, hope and change, right? Like it's 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 a it's a line that resonates with people because everyone wants change. Everyone wants something new. Everyone wants something different, right? You you don't want to go and get the same hamburger over and over and over again. You want, you want a variety. You, you want you uh, so. It, it stands to reason politicians are trying to fuck you, right? So they, they, they try to convince you that you need more variety. You don't want to be married anymore. Um, but sometimes marriage is actually a good thing. It's steady and it's, it's, it's stable and it's reliable and uh, it can be really beneficial if you think about it that way as opposed to just hopping around like a crazy person. And what do we have for and another thing? Well, wrapping things up, it wouldn't be down ballot if we didn't have a great grandma going after some malfeasant with their cane on camera a great grandmother in oakland is being hailed a hero for chasing off a robber attacking her 82 year old neighbor but she says she would do that for anyone ktv crime reporter henry <laughs> lee here in studio
studio after speaking to them both. Henry? Yeah, Mike, she says she would do what she did for anyone, even a stranger. And she took action even while struggling with bad knees and carrying a cane. She saved my life. She saved my future. I really appreciate it. 82-year-old Ann is counting her blessings. Surveillance video shows her walking home in West Oakland earlier this month. This black Kia Optima is waiting for her. And then this happens. No! 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 When I resisted him, he shoved me down so that I fell backwards on the road. And uh, I know Faye, she sees everything. Faye is her next door neighbor. This is her running into the street with her cane as the robber continues to struggle with Ann. Faye says even with her bad hey. knees, she knew she had to help Ann. She rushed down her front steps. Fuck yeah. The time I got off the second stair, I just didn't feel it anymore. I just started going, running to her aid. Kia starts to drive off, but Faye continues to run and uses her cane as a weapon. I threw it. I thought I could break that back window with yeah. it. <laughs> Go for it, babe. Go for it. Ann is physically unharmed and still has her purse. Faye doesn't think she did anything special. It's just something that I do. It's something that I knew was necessary. It's like I whoop do. that ass. So, and it's what I do. As well. So even if she was a stranger, I would have did the same thing. <laughs> of course, we can't forget about Faye's German Shepherd, Troy. <gasps> oh. After Faye repeatedly calls for him, the trusty dog comes out as backup. Oh. Troy went out to make sure. And oh. Faye oh, oh, right to the neighbor. Where's your mother and father? How was you raised? You know, uh, go get a job. The two women have always looked out for each other. She's very modest about it. And she's done a lot of things for me without ever expecting anything in return. So I really, she's a wonderful neighbor and a wonderful person. But this stood out. I told her, I said, you're my hero. And, um, and I'll stand by that. Faye says she doesn't get scared. She might get scared a couple hours later, but that's about it. She says whether it's someone <laughs> having a heart attack or is choking, she has and will take care of it. Live in the studio, Henry Lee, KTVU, Fox 2 News. I mean, Henry, it seems like there was just no hesitation right there. That's right. She got Except by the dog. She was, uh, lucky right, <laughs> right? The dog's a little timid, but he's a little old, you know? I, I forgive him. Neighborly love right he's there. probably had Henry better days. Here in studio, Henry, thank you. Well, that was a great story to end it with. I really, she was like, I was hoping I could bust that back window. I was like, yeah, get him, a, grandma, get him. That was a fabulous cane toss. That was really aggressive and really well accurate tank cane toss. You could hear it smack off the car. Like, I think that guy was genuinely scared. Maybe more of the dog, but obviously there was too much to be afraid of with the dog. But anyway, get yourself a neighbor like Faye. That's, that's the, basically the, the moral of that story. Yep. All right. Excellent. Well, shall we read it out? Yep. Go ahead. All right. Well, um, everyone, please stay tuned for Local Love this evening, uh, uh, the second part of our Locals Spectacular here every Tuesday night. You can join us here for Down Ballot, 7.30 p.m. Pacific. We encourage you to uh, subscribe to the Twitch. Go give us some money on Patreon. Go to the website, ecoplexmedia.com. You can find out how to do all of these things. And remember, uh, you've got to get your vaccinations. you got to wear a mask when it's appropriate. And pants are always optional. Have a great night. <laughs> It's Friday night, I think it's time to get the party started Pick up my phone just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice for the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car just to get to where they are Here at the local scene is where I plant my feet It's where I smoke my cigarette and I hold my drink I look at all my friends, they're all blazing greens Here at the front of the stage waiting for MTV Where are those guys who's standing next to me With a pipe in his hand ready to blaze for me About five minutes later we're all singing We now get the fuck up on stage and rock the scene Yeah, we do what we want and what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, what we want to do, and what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy the band. I turn and head back to the bar for a refill, man, because you know where we are. We're headed out to the car. 
to smoke another one, Whoa. and another one. Whoa. Now just when the magic starts kicking in, I hear we left playing, and you know it's time to head in. All right, everybody, now it's time to grab a new drink, spark it if you got it, and then pass it to me. Yeah, we do what we want. And what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, what we want to do, and what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy that band. Last up on the field for the show tonight, it's down me dirty and five, so we're headed outside. Just fuck up another joint now, who's got my lighter? Stone E, of course, shouldn't you be inside? I'm all up in this bitch being who I gotta be I'm fucked up like the US economy The truth is is that I don't think logically Stone to E take you on a psychedelic odyssey Now inside motherfuckers is rocking me And outside shit we smoke a lot of rockin' Rockin' the rolly on a sexy girl be jockin' me Ain't too drunk to fuck but don't probably do it stoppin' We do what we want What we wanna do And what we want is to jam So sit back and So sit back and enjoy the band Sit back and enjoy the band